Hello and welcome to Axis Asia here on France 24. Coming up, Myanmar's junta faces its biggest threat since seizing power. For the first time, different groups of well-armed rebels have joined forces and are gaining ground with the aim of restoring democratic rule. Rivals China and the U.S. found common ground at the APEC summit. Xi Jinping and Joe Biden agree to crack down on fentanyl production. We'll take a closer look. And head of the class, not only are Vietnamese students outperforming peers in nearby Malaysia and Thailand, but also in wealthier countries like Britain and Canada. We'll find out why. Well, it may be a turning point in Myanmar. Rebels have reportedly seized 100 outposts in the north of the country, including several key towns and crucial trade routes. The offensives began last month in Shan State. Behind it is an alliance of three ethnic armies. They aim to overthrow the junta and restore democratic rule. Their gains have also encouraged resistance forces elsewhere in the country, which have also seized several towns. And the military installed president warned that the country is in danger of breaking apart. For more, let's speak to David Camero, a senior research fellow at the Center for International Studies at Sciences Po University. Hello to you. David, thank you for coming in. Um, sure. Just want to begin, first of all, by some reports I've seen, the areas that the rebels have seized, uh, it's more than 8,000 square kilometers. How significant are these advances? They are significant. We're talking about, uh, you know, over half of the country now. Um, that that was already, we were already getting there before these four offences, because there have, in fact, been four offences. The, the one that you spoke about on the 27th of October, Operation 1027, uh, was the Brotherhood Alliance in, in Shan State. What was interesting is that amongst the Brotherhood Alliance were fighters from Rakhine State, which is to the, uh, to the west and for the south, and they joined. Um, the 7th of November, there was a second offensive by the Karinis, uh, which also seized outposts and, and territory, followed by the Arakan army returning last Monday, um, and they launching an offensive uh, in Pakpo, and they were in a ceasefire with the military prior to that. And finally, in the same day, the Qin resistance, which has been fairly effective in fighting against the, the junta, also seized other territories. So we've got, now got a situation where if you look at all of the border areas, there's virtually, you know, the, the government has lost control. Huh? Uh, the junta has lost control. So what needs to be looked at now is in the Bama heartland, or the inspector of the the Sagan region north of Mandalay, whether these um, successes will encourage the Bama um, opposition uh, to, to join in. Uh, and that will be very, very complicated for the UNTA. It certainly sounds like a domino effect. Uh, if the fighting spreads, um, what are the humanitarian concerns? What are the impacts on local populations? Uh, well, there's already been, I think we're talking about several million people displaced even prior to this. And they, in their displacement camps, then become targets for airstrikes by, by the, the junta. Because the only military advantage the junta really has is air power and air mobility. Um, and there have been attempts by putting restrictions on fuel supplies to limit that possibility. But one wonders whether the provision of you know, several Stinger missiles, anti-aircraft missiles, destroying that capacity to, to bombard um, and, and, uh, civilian populations and also to transport troops uh, and ending their mobility, that would really spell, spell the, the beginning of the end uh, for the junta, for some observers at least. Uh, China backs the junta, but it also has been reported that this, these offensives couldn't go uh, forward without approval from Beijing. Why is it playing both sides? Well, it, it depends which China you're talking about. There were, in fact, th there were three and a half Chinas involved here. Uh, the one, there's Beijing, but there's also the government of Yunnan. Uh, uh, Beijing and Yunnan have very strong strategic interests. Uh, the, you know, the pipelines going to the Bay of Bengal, the uh, uh, the railway project to Man through Mandalay, very significantly important for, for, the, for the Chinese. So there, there's a different perspective from Beijing and uh, from Kunming in Yunnan. Then you've got a, a third group, which are the Chinese criminals. Uh, uh, and this is causing a problem for Beijing because they're seeing on their borders uh, these criminal gangs involved in human trafficking, setting up centers for scamming. Um, and that is a, a, you know, an international embarrassment for, for Beijing. 
Now, the, the, it's clear that the Chinese have a very effective security operation. They would have been aware of what was going to happen. Uh, and what is interesting is the Wa National Army, which is a kind of the fourth China or the third and a half China, which is a kind of puppet uh, regime of the Chinese, which is, is a major arms supplier uh, to the ethnic armed forces, although officially Beijing you know, supports the junta through the provision of, of armaments. So you know, what is happening is uh, uh, Beijing is playing it both ways uh, at the moment. We always forget that they had very good relations with Aung San Suu Kyi and the National League for Democracy in that, that period of democratic rule from 2015 to 2020. Uh, and David, I mean, putting you in a difficult position with this question, but what do you imagine we'll see in the coming weeks? I think we'll see a, uh, a continuation of these taking over of, of, of towns, small towns and villages. Uh, and we'll see the Junta having to choose whether they withdraw and then withdraw to the fortress capital of Nompido uh, and the capital, the economic capital of Yangon. Um, because they are, what is we've seen is they are now incapable of sending reinforcements to areas under attack. And they're incapable of sending <coughs> forces to retake uh, those areas. The only thing they can do is then bomb the hell out of the, the civilian population. But that is not going to win hearts and minds so, uh, and makes it even more likely that uh, ultimately the, 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 there will be perhaps within the junta some kind of internal coup, a putsch, uh, and Minan Lung will be replaced, whether it will be replaced by somebody more moderate and more amenable to negotiations. All right, David, thank you very much. David Camru from Sciences Po University. Thank you. The presidents of China and the U.S. met at the Asian Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit in San Francisco. Xi Jinping told Joe Biden the world was big enough for both superpowers. The leaders did agree to work together to try and tackle drug trafficking, in particular curbing fentanyl production in China, which is home to a thriving chemical industry. Oliver Ferry reports. Could China hold the key to tackling one of U.S. society's worst crises, the scourge of the opioid fentanyl? Beijing has pledged to clamp down on exports of the chemicals that fuel the trade in the drug. Speaking at the Apex Summit in San Francisco, Xi Jinping was being conciliatory. I would like you to know that China sympathizes deeply with American people, especially the young suffering from fentanyl. President Biden and I agreed to set up a working group on the control of narcotics, furthering our cooperation to help the U.S. tackle drug abuse. China is the main producer of chemicals and materials used to make fentanyl. They are shipped, often legally, to destinations in the United States and also Canada and Mexico, where they are processed and the resulting fentanyl later smuggled into the U.S. Deaths from fentanyl overdoses in the U.S. massively dwarf those from other controlled drugs, with 67,000 people dying in 2021, up from barely 2,100 a decade earlier. The compact size of fentanyl makes it much easier to smuggle and thus far more lucrative than other drugs, such as cocaine and heroin. China had previously taken action at Washington's request in 2019 to reduce the amount of fentanyl being shipped directly to the United States, but as Joe Biden said in San Francisco, the situation has rapidly changed. The challenge has evolved from finished fentanyl to fentanyl chemical ingredients and, and pill presses, which are being shipped without control. So today, with this new understanding, we're taking action to significantly reduce the flow of precursor chemicals and pill presses from China to the Western Hemisphere. It's going to save lives, and I appreciate President Xi's commitment on this issue. Beijing is expected to get things in return, such as the lifting of sanctions on China's Forensic Police Institute. It has been accused by Washington of involvement in human rights abuses against the Uyghur ethnic minority in China's Xinjiang region. The U.S. Justice Department has this year indicted eight Chinese companies for their alleged role in producing precursor materials for fentanyl. It's as yet unclear if those lawsuits will be dropped as part of any deal, or even how far an agreement can go to get a powerfully addictive drug off U.S. streets. Well, education experts are trying to glean a lesson from Vietnam. Not only are Vietnamese students outperforming their peers in Malaysia and Thailand, 
but also in much wealthier countries like Britain and Canada. Our team on the ground reports. The school day in this rural area of Vietnam begins with the national anthem. It's still only 7.30 a.m. when the first class gets underway. There are 45 students in this class, but the lesson goes without a hitch. A quarter of Vietnam's 100 million people are children. Well-trained teachers are given what they need to cope with large class sizes. We're trained to teach classes of 45 students. Whenever the children misbehave, I give them a look, and they know that they need to stay focused or else. Crucially, teachers are evaluated based on their students' performance. Those whose students succeed are rewarded with a prestigious award for excellence. In this communist country, the emphasis is on results, not necessarily equality. The students at this school study eight hours a day, Monday to Friday, and for four hours on Saturday mornings. This school is located in the remote countryside, yet it's equipped with the latest education technology. And it's not alone. The Vietnamese government requires all municipalities to invest a fifth of their budget in education. This year, we bought 12 TVs and lots of tables and chairs and other materials as well. We spent almost 10,000 euros in total. Preschools also play their part in Vietnam's success. Before we go, now I will ask one person in each team, what's your favorite color? At this private nursery, four- and five-year-olds are already studying English. This morning, they're using songs to remember the colors. I want to learn English because it's fun. Hello, everyone. My name is This English teacher has been here for six years. If you teach them English when they are very young, it is easier for them to learn because at a very young age, their brain is very active and they can learn a lot. The approach works. Vietnamese students are among the best in the world, outperforming their counterparts in Britain and Canada in international evaluations. That's it for this edition of Access Asia. Thank you for watching and please stay tuned to France 24.